start recor recording here. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about leadership versus management. And uh, uh, yeah, this is a debated subject. Uh, I think you can tell based on the videos that I sent you um, that I put in the playlist and based on my slides that I lean in one direction. Um, I believe that you can have good management and still not be excellent. And I think the determining factor in pretty much everything is leadership. In fact, one of my favorite authors, John Maxwell, says everything rises and falls on leadership. He also said that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And um, that bears itself out in the literature. We'll get to that whenever I um, go over the definition of leadership here um, coming up. Um, but right now, I, I want you to be thinking, because I'm going to get to uh, slide seven here, where I'm going to ask you to be thinking about a person that you've either experienced as a supervisor who has been a leader or a manager or both. And I want you to write the person's name down. And I want you to be thinking about it as I go through these slides. I want you to be thinking about um, whether they fit the characteristics of leader or manager and sometimes people are both but it helps if you get somebody kind of polarizing in your mind um you know good boss bad boss whatever um and then i'm just going to randomly when i get to uh slide seven here i'm just going to ask randomly for you all to you don't have to give me the name just give me um you know describe the relationship that you have with the person and um some of the characteristics that make them either a leader or a manager all right um <clears throat> Well, that was different. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay, so uh, contents for this presentation, reviewing the operational excellence model, uh, which you've seen before, but I just want to keep putting it in front of you so you uh, get it kind of uh, wired, hardwired into your brain. Uh, we're going to define management, and then we'll define leadership, and then I'll talk about how you balance the two um, because leaders operate management systems. All right. All right, so hopefully this is not um, something new. Hopefully you've begun to see this diagram up here. I normally keep it on a whiteboard behind me, but um, I pulled this out of one of my marketing pieces so that we would have it in front of us. The blue circles on the diagram are uh, on the human access. axis, and you, you'll see that that's positive culture and team leadership. And then the yellow circles are on the operational axis, strategy and improvement management. And then operational excellence is the force that kind of takes all those and, and uh, uh, binds them, those, those forces that are operating at the intersection of the human and the operational axis. And I like to think of that, if you can think of that um, as the daily experience in a business. So if you get into the inside of that circle there, you see where the cross section is, everything's green in that circle. Um, because we're, what I'm, I'm trying to imply with this diagram is that you can't, you can't do anything in one without affecting the other. It operates as a system, and uh, those four forces are constantly pressuring the organization in one way or another, whether you have an operational excellence system or not. If, if, you, if you have an operational excellence system or model, then essentially what it's doing is it's laying over top of those four forces and trying to keep them uh, optimize them, integrate them, synthesize them so that that the organization can achieve success. Radical success is the thing that I, I try to emphasize to my clients. Um, so uh, we're going to take a look at the idea of management in the operational excellence system. So we're going to look, be looking at strategy management, improvement management. And just, we're, I'm not going to go into details because we'll be getting into that over the next couple of weeks. But um, in particular, I just want to focus us in on the fact that these are management systems. So one of them is uh, managing improvement, and that one's focused on problem solving. And the other one is managing the strategy in the organization. So um, how do we design strategy? How do we deploy strategy? How do we make sure that we're um, actually uh, accomplishing the things that we said that we were going to do in terms of strategy? Uh, but both of these things are management systems. So let's go ahead. First of all, define management. Um, as I said earlier, uh, you know, you're going to get stuff from me that, it, that tilts in the direction of, um, of leadership. Hold on a second here. I think we might have somebody in the, uh, yep. 
Got a bunch of people in the waiting room. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, give these guys a second to get caught up here. Thanks, Ryan, for letting me know that. All right, well, those guys are settling back in there. So <clears throat> you're going to get mainly the negative version of stuff, uh, uh, management from me. However, I should say that, um, you know, I've got my master's in operational excellence, and it's a master's in management from St. Vincent College. And so management is a broad term. Some definitions of management actually include leadership as a subset. I'm not in that camp because I see them as two separate fields, two disciplines of study. Um, one is uh, much more social science uh, oriented and the other one is, is, is not. Um, but let's just stick with this for right now. So defining management, the first thing that Sinek said was that it was the manipulation of others for gain. Um, the other thing that Sinek says is that it's getting things done right. And I know the English, the grammar isn't great there, but, um, and that's, that's in distinction with or contradistinction with um, getting the right things done. And we'll look at that when we get to leadership. But um, I went straight to the literature. So this is what uh, a writer on management said, that it is supervising human resources and operations to ensure they meet objectives. So it's pretty, pretty flat. It's, it, in fact, it doesn't even say people. It doesn't say supervising people. It says supervising human resources and operations to ensure they meet objectives. On the other hand, leadership is influencing a group of people to attain a shared goal. Um, North, North House is one of the go-to books for um, leadership. This is the book here, um, Leadership by North House. And uh, I've got mine all dog-eared and highlighted up here. But um, people either see leadership as a position that you hold. So you hold a position of leadership or they see it as a process. And so uh, we're gonna handle it in the context of our discussion as a process. So uh, leadership is the process of influencing a group to attain a shared goal. Um, and as I said before, Cynic would say it's getting the right things done. So it's not getting things done right, it's making sure that you're picking and choosing the right things to do. There are three models for operational excellence leadership that I'll continually uh, go back to. And I just researched this last year. I published some stuff. Uh, if you're interested, you can read it on LinkedIn. But uh, I published some stuff that connected operational excellence leadership with a reduction of medical errors. So medical errors are a big deal. Um, they're the third, well, they were the third leading cause of death in the United States. Right now, COVID is um, sneaking, eking up there to be the third leading cause of death in the United States but medical errors, meaning um, I went in to get care and something bad happened and it caused a death. Um, but uh, the research I did last year uh, was focused on what kind of leadership models, what kind of leadership theories seem to be effective in reducing medical errors. And then um, as I did that research, I began to expand it out and realized that these three forms of leadership that we're looking at here um, continually crop up in operational excellence literature. So, uh, and, and they're always attached to um, positive outcomes. So these are the three that we'll be looking at as we, as you think about leadership and operational excellence, transformational leadership, servant leadership, and shared leadership. Um, the first two are, are very similar. Um, although one is uh, leader centric, the other one is follower centric. Um, both are leader centric in the sense that they tell the leader what they ought to be doing or how they ought to be um, approaching leadership. But the third one, shared leadership, is a completely different animal. I'll talk about that in a minute. Transformational leadership has these four uh, points. You're not going to be responsible for these four points or for these uh, for the details under each of these, but I will probably include these in the test in terms of the three leadership models for operational excellence. But transformational leadership has these four uh, components to it. So idealized influence individual consideration, inspirational motivation, and intellectual stimulation. They all are what they sound like. So idealized influence <clears throat> is when um, a leader comes back to or navigates back to um, a moral center, okay? In fact, when uh, the um, 
when the transformational leader doesn't have a moral center. In other words, they're deliberately neglecting any kind of a moral or ethical basis for the way that they're um, exercising this form of leadership. The absence of that is called pseudo-transformational leadership. Don't worry about it. Um, but idealized influence is the idea of going back to a set of values and helping followers see that what they're doing is consistently exercising a set of values, okay? Um, so let me just uh, diverge here and tell you a quick story. So uh, back after 9-11, um, hopefully I didn't tell you this story already, but I got recalled to active duty and I was, uh, I was um, leaving my house here in Pennsylvania and I was driving down to Norfolk where I was being out-processed or in-processed. Uh, I was a reserve naval officer and I had gotten recalled to active duty. And um, as I was driving down to uh, Norfolk, I got stuck in this traffic around the Beltway in DC and I was already steamed because I was um, being recalled to active duty. Even though I knew what I was getting into, it still was uh, a little disruptive. Um, we had four small kids. And, um, but as I'm driving down to Norfolk, I get stuck in this huge traffic jam on uh, I-95 South, South of DC. And I mean, if you guys have ever been down there, you know, it's like eight lanes of traffic and it was a parking lot and um, my meter is just getting pegged. And um, at about the point where I was going to just boil over, I looked around and I saw um, all these cars in the traffic with these American flags. And if you, know, you guys are so young, you probably don't even remember this, but um, that was one of the things that happened right after 9-11. Um, many, many people began to uh, show their patriotism outwardly by putting an American flag sticker or actually a flag or some sort of a, a thing on their car to indicate um, solidarity and patriotism. And as I looked around, I, I really, you know, began to think about, wow, this is, this is kind of crazy because if you think about the demographics of the uh, people that were in that traffic jam, south of DC on I-95, you got all kind of different people there. Um, but all kind of different people all at once had decided to, do, to take this one same behavior. So if you go back to the um, cultural triangle and you think about the top of the cultural triangle as, as actions and down here at the base are values, somewhere in the middle are mindsets. Let's not even talk about that right now. Let's just go from straight from values to actions. Somewhere down here, the situation after 9-11 pricked the value of patriotism in many, many people, and they all up here at the action point decided to display their patriotism using an American flag. But the thing about the, the uh, group of people, the population of cars that were on that road at that given time, um, was that it was exceptionally diverse. You think about socioeconomic, you think about um, race, creed, you think about any way that you could slice and dice a population, single parent home, double parent home, um, you know, uh, just any way you could slice and dice the social demographics of that traffic jam down there, yet something pricked a single value that, that everyone shared and that resonated with others. And so, boom, out comes this value. That's what idealized influence is. Uh, it also reflects this idea of inspirational motivation. Um, so the, the two, I, mean, I skipped over individual consideration, I'll get back to that, but inspirational motivation um, is where the leader is actually uh, causing people to go beyond what they would normally do. And again, so mo most of the time, if you look at our country today, we're extremely divided around uh, a couple of key issues here. Um, but I'd like to think that, and not that we would ever want this to happen again, but there may be one singular thing that would unify the country and you get this, um, you get this uh, uh, influence where a single thing would prick a value down here and, and action would come out here. This is a really important um, understanding for thinking about leadership, especially as you're thinking about examples. So examples of leaders who have caused you to do more than you thought that you were able to do. That's a transformational leader. Um, uh, a leader who you could look at and you could see an example of moral and ethical leadership um, and you wanted to be like that person, okay? That's a transformational leader. Um, the next thing on the list though, individual consideration. So the other thing a transformational leader does 
is they work one-on-one. -on -one. So even though they're leading a group or a team or a whole organization, um, they're going to do this type of leadership on a one-to-one -one basis. So they're going to dial right into exactly what it is about you that they can influence using idealized uh, influence. So in other words, navigating the values um, or inspirational motivation. They're going to know what gets you going and what inspires you. And so this is a really powerful form of leadership. The last one is intellectual stimulation. Um, we are, as human beings, we're thinking beings, we're reasoning beings, we're rational beings. And so therefore, leaders have to be, um, they have to respect people enough to say, wait, if I say we ought to do this for this reason, there may be other perspectives. My, you know, my group, group may be, or my team may be thinking about this in some other way. And so intellectual stimulation is where a, a leader engages with a follower in order to help them to understand why we're doing this. And so if you've watched some of those Simon Sinek videos that I've teed up for you, I can't remember if I put why, I'm pretty sure I put uh, start with why in the video list um, previously. But that's what he's talking about. Like we, we've got to, as leaders, we've got to help people to understand why it is that we're doing what we're doing, the purpose behind it. That's the bottom of the triangle down here, maybe even below the bottom of the triangle here. Um, that helps them to understand how they ought to think about it. That's the intellectual stimulation piece of this. Um, the next thing on the list there is servant leadership, and maybe you've heard of this. Uh, this was popularized by a guy named Greenleaf in 1974. And um, the, the big deal about this is that it is oriented to service to others in service to the mission. So um, I'm gonna do this. This is not the cultural triangle now, this is an organizational triangle. And in an organizational triangle, the leadership typically uh, exists at the top of the organizational triangle. When people try to show us servant leadership, what they want to do, what they tell us to do is turn the, let me see if I can do this, turn the triangle upside down here. Looks like one of those hearts, but turn the triangle upside down so that the leader is actually at the bottom of the organization supporting everybody um, from the bottom of the organization. Um, sees themselves first as a servant um, and then, you know, and that's the style of leadership that they actually um, promote. You can see how the two kind of go together. Now, you know, transformational leadership may not be a servant leader. A servant leader, in my humble opinion, based on the research that I've done, a servant leader tends to have some of the characteristics of a transformational leader, especially those two that I uh, spent a lot of time talking about, idealized influence and inspirational motivation. A uh, servant leader tries to help people to understand why it is that we're doing what we're doing. They get people to operate way outside of uh, what what they would normally be able to do simply by appealing to their value system or to common values here. Um, servant leaders also uh, kind of put the organization in the context of a greater society or a greater good. So we're, they're always trying to, even in, in for-profit situations, they're trying to make sure that um, people in the organization understand that there's more than the organization at stake here, that um, there's a greater good in society that we need to be paying attention to. Um, and then the last model for operational excellence leadership is called shared leadership. Um, it is also known as distributed, collective, team. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. But uh, shared leadership is where a leader takes their, um, the responsibilities of their leadership and spreads them out among the group. And, and a couple things, couple conditions for shared leadership. One is that the group member or the team member has to be willing to accept the responsibility. So this isn't me as a leader thrusting um, my leadership responsibility on somebody. It's me um, making it available for others in the team to be able to pick up if they're willing to pick it up. So there's a fluidity in this style of leadership that you don't see in some of the other ones. Um, people that are really good at shared leadership, you would walk in maybe to a meeting that they're having and you really wouldn't be able to tell who the leader is uh, based on the conversation. And that, that is exceptional um, shared or distributed leadership. leadership. Um, shared or distributed leadership is becoming um, a much more popular concept, both in research and in practice, because um, 
teams based on globalization and technology teams are becoming to be uh, they're, they're getting more virtual um, and then when you began to overlay COVID over top of that and what happened um, in the spring of this past year uh, where many people were driven into remote working situations um, the idea of being a virtual team leader uh, became a serious thing and virtual team leaders have to do this by nature it's really hard to be uh, singularly a transformational leader on a virtual team. It works, but the way that things operate, um, they, they, you just have to do it in a different way. So um, there's a lot of literature out there right now on shared or distributed leadership on virtual teams. Again, not that you have to read it, but if you're interested in some of my research on this, I published it again on LinkedIn um, last fall. But the um, the interesting thing about these three forms or three models of leadership is that when you begin to synthesize them, when you begin to mesh them up, uh, then some really powerful things happen, um, particularly whenever it comes to operational excellence. So we're going to set that aside right now. A lot of information there. <clears throat> and we're going to try to contrast the two. So, um, Unlike management, this is uh, from a paper I just read this afternoon, unlike management, which is more transactional and focused on efficiencies and effectiveness, leadership relates to influencing and appropriately incentivizing others. Okay, so uh, let's just dwell on this for a second. A lot of us, when we think about operational excellence, me included, um, you know, like when I, I have to, when I do sales calls with executive leaders and I say operational excellence, I immediately have to probe for how did they just hear me? How did they perceive me? What did they understand me saying? Do they hear efficiency and effectiveness or do they hear influence and incentivization? Um, and, and then I, you know, again, I, I do individualized consideration and I try to figure out how I can communicate with them clearly about what it is that I do. I do both, but it's in balance. And we'll get to that in a second here, but it's in balance. So leadership is different than management. Management is more transactional and it's focused on efficiency and effectiveness. And if you think about that diagram, um, improvement management is focusing on efficiency and effectiveness and strategy management is as well. As opposed to leadership in the, in the human axis, we're talking about leadership, team leadership, and um, positive culture. And that picks up the rest of this year. Um, when we think about one version or the other, Nair 2013 said uh, these three things. This is how uh, this guy contrasted the two. Um, that management is counting value whereas leadership is creating value. Leadership is uh, creating circles of influence. Management is creating circles of power. And then leading people, um, leadership is leading people. Management is managing work. Now, there are times when, as a manager, you'll be managing people as well, but you're, you're managing things like their schedule um, or you're managing their day, their time off, or their compensation. So, um, and that again is in, dis in distinction with um, influencing them to pursue a common goal and work, right, work for a, uh, a common goal. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the uh, screen share here. And so I can see everybody's faces who's sharing. Hey, it's good to see you guys again. Um, all right. So uh, who wants to go first? Somebody give me, let's do this on a volunteer basis. Somebody give me an example of a person that come to, came to mind. Again, no names. Just a person that came to mind. Are they a leader? Are they a manager? And why? Somebody want to go first? Ryan, you are for, Ryan. You are uh, highlighted on my screen, so I'm just going to call on you, man. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So, someone who was a leader or a manager. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I work at a, a car wash now, so my manager there is. She just kind of sits in her office, though. She doesn't really do that much. So what do you think, leader or manager? Oh, she's a manager. Okay. 
All right. So, I mean, that's one clear indication, right? Like if you don't see the person that you're working for, then chances are they may be a manager. Or if you only see them when they're, the, when they're asking you, so when can you work next week? Hey, can you cover this extra shift that I needed covered? Or, you know, oh, you know what? You really screwed up. You, you know, you made 16 instead of 20 yesterday. You really screwed up, you know, so you got to increase your production. Um, all right, uh, Chris, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I thought of my boss, my current boss, who uh, also happens to be the co-founder of the company mm -hmm. I work for. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess it kind of depends who you ask, because to me, he's more of a leader, I guess. But I feel like if you ask some other people that work there, they would say he's more of a manager. Um, I'm not sure if that's just because I do more things there and I'm kind of around everywhere. Mm -hmm or what, but uh, he definitely inspires me at least and kind of focuses on how I'm doing and what's going on. That's good. Okay, so you're picking up on that, um, that uh, inspirational motivation and individual consideration. Yeah, so maybe a transformational leader. Um, well, let's see, Brian Reams, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I was that just, one for us? I guess my current boss. Um, I guess just more so he's probably a manager, in my opinion. Uh, he just doesn't really like influence anybody or push anybody. But sometimes I guess he could be a leader because he is out on the floor helping us sometimes and whatnot. So more so a manager, but a little bit of both at times. Yeah, so uh, interesting, uh, interesting observation out on the floor helping you. So again, I, I don't know, you know, and I'm not, not trying to influence you one way or the other, but again, just for our discussion, um, there are times when a manager will get on on the floor and help people, but he or she may be helping people in order to make production so that, you know, an operational goal is met. In that case, that's management. That's not necessarily leadership. If uh, a group of people is doing a particularly um, uh, dirty or um, time-consuming job, you know, if they, I think I talked to you guys about um, the leader that, that came alongside of us and worked alongside of us. Um, uh, my, my skipper, my commanding officer from the Navy, um, you know, he, he wasn't doing that just to get the job done. He was doing that to work alongside of us and to inspire us by, you know, being an example. So that would be the difference. Um, Tyler, how about you? You in a safe place there to talk? I, I can't tell where you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm just in the library. I'm not worried okay. about bothering anybody really. Okay. I'm in like the lounge area. So, okay. Good. Anyway. Um, so I would say one person that I would think would be more of a manager would be I've I played sports like all my life right mm -hmm. um, so when I first came to college I was I'm on, I'm on the swim team here in college and I would say that when I was a freshman I had this one team captain who not anything close to being an actual leader uh, like anything that we talk about in this class about being a good like organizational leader right uh he had he met none of those so mm -hmm. technically even though he wasn't in the realm of the business world he yeah. wasn't a manager because mm -hmm. he wasn't he wasn't supportive he didn't listen he wasn't compassionate he wasn't a service leader of course like he, he was nothing he just like kind of like threw his weight around yeah like, and he was like quote unquote, like don't mind me but like he thought he was like the shit yeah yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. like yeah. at the same time like he just i don't know like so many times when i think of a leader i think of how to be different than him in a way so yeah, he was a manager. Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's good stuff. Yeah. So the other thing, I guess, again, from just a piggyback on that, you can discern it pretty quickly. Like, so, you know, you can tell, like, especially if you're working with or alongside of somebody, you can discern this pretty quickly. Um, Maeve, how about you? I can see your face. So I'm going to call on you. Um, definitely an example of a really good leader in my experience. Um, for pretty much since high school, I've worked on and off um, for one of my teachers as a studio assistant. Mm -hmm. um, so just working on really complicated sculptures. Um, and then, you know, this, this stuff I do is kind of menial because I'm an assistant. And, you know, a lot of times it's just scrubbing steel with mm -hmm. mineral spirits. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also work where I feel very valued and I learn more um, about life and about art than I could really, you know, mm -hmm. kind of put into words just based on how um, the person that I assist uh, works with me. 
That's awesome. So you're describing a servant leader, somebody who really cares to teach you about what it is that you're doing. And then immediately when you said, I feel valued, mm -hmm. um, that's an indication of a servant leader. So servant leaders make you feel valued. Um, and I think you guys know this because you're part of, uh, you know, this, uh, there's a generational, um, uh, there's a set of features that each generation kind of carries with them into the, into a, uh, the workforce as a new generation. And one of the things you all carry in is this idea of being valued. And, you know, don't let people tell you that that's a bad thing because I mean, it isn't, it, you know, it's, it's important for us to be able to engage with the work that we're doing, even if it is something menial like, like Maeve was talking about, um, because work is work and work is valuable. And that's servant leadership would talk about it that way. Okay. Um, let's do one more and then let's move on here. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I work at the Greensburg country club mm -hmm. and, uh, so my job there is kind of like just cleaning carts and like we clean everyone's bags once they come in from the course and stuff like that. And uh, there's been several times like this fall where we've had someone call off on the night before. And so I kind of got stuck by myself and it's really more of a two person job just because of how like busy the course gets and stuff. And on more than one occasion, my boss has stayed late with me and taking care of like carts and stuff with me while I clean all the bags and stuff. And we've been there till like eight, nine o'clock some nights where he could have easily just, you know, gone home. And especially since that's not really his job title, he's the PGA pro at the course. So, yeah. He kind of goes above what his job title really is just to make sure that, you know, I'm not there till like, you know, 11 o'clock or whatever. Let me ask you a question. How do you, uh, in terms of your loyalty, how loyal are you based on that? I would definitely say I'm more loyal to him than I would be if, you know, he just kind of, you know, left me and said, oh, sorry, you got to be here late, but too bad where I mean, yeah. you know, I would definitely like go out of my way to, you know, cover a shift or, you know, do something for him if he needed it just because I know he's, He's gone out out of his way for me, so that's cool. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm a fan of uh, strong, positive leadership like that. I think it's it's the best kind of uh, it generates the best kind of relationship between leader and follower. Um, what about leaders who aren't positional leaders? So I think we got into this. I think if you watched all the video uh, playlist, you probably got some indication of this. But Ed, what do you think? Um, you okay to talk where you're sitting? Yeah, I can talk. Yep. So what do you think about this question of, you know, does it matter whether they're like a, a supervisor over me um, or could I have a transformational leader in the organization that isn't a positional leader? Uh, yeah, I definitely believe in that. Um, an example, I guess, that I can think of that is um, for the past two summers, I've been working uh, at a bottling plant for a dairy. Mm -hmm. And so in that position, um, I was just like a maintenance um, assistant. Mm -hmm. and obviously me just going in with a temporary job like I didn't really have any like formal education on like how to like maintenance the you know like bottling machines and mm -hmm. any of those kind of tasks and there was a lot of times where it was uh the maintenance just was like, worked as a team in general like our boss was a little bit more hands-off I mean he was still like great guy and all but just mm -hmm. a little bit more hands-off in that aspect but um definitely there's been times when working within my team of maintenance men that uh like at certain jobs like they would step up and say like okay this is how this is going to go and this is like why it needs to be done this way mm -hmm. and just i think that definitely there's a team aspect that can elevate like you want everyone to be on the same level at a team level yeah so this is an interesting point you want everybody to be at the same level on the team level this uh shared leadership model that we talked about uh, one of the byproducts of it is that you're actually generating future positional leaders by distributing this leadership responsibility. So you actually get to see how people um, react and behave in leadership um, when they have leadership responsibilities. That becomes powerful whenever you get to leadership development here. All right, uh, hold on a second. Let me share the screen again. All right, thanks for doing that. Um, so uh, next point here is that we've got to balance the two. So I know I've been hard on management, but uh, the deal is both are necessary. They are absolutely necessary, especially in an operational excellence system. You can't have operational excellence unless you have both leadership and management. Um, point number two is that you got to 
uh, encourage leaders to operate the management systems. When they do that, they're also leading. So um, when I coach executive teams or whenever I coach senior leaders um, in the operational excellence system, the first thing we install, hold on a second, let me get back here. Let's see if I'm facile enough to do this. Um, the first thing that we install is, oh man, I'm all over the place. I thought I was doing so good. There we go. Uh, the first thing that we, we install is the improvement management system here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not, but um, we install the improvement management system here. And the reason I do that is because I want to get this interface. I actually need a little uh, for Pete's sake. Thank you guys for being patient with me. You know, laser pointer. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, I want to get this interface going between team leadership and improvement management immediately. Because if I don't get this going right away, I'm never going to get positive culture and, and strategy management down at all. This, um, this improvement management spins um, plan, do, check, act cycles on a daily basis. And so there's an opportunity every single day for a leader to overlap with that management system and operate it. And when they operate the management system, see if I can go back to where I was. Yeah, when they operate the management system, um, they're actually leading, they're actually able to influence. So if I get the management system in there, spinning on a daily basis, then there's an opportunity for leaders to exercise leadership, which the idea of this, this influence in the process um, every single day. But the key point here is that both are absolutely necessary. Both of these things are absolutely necessary. All right. Um, so summary, some summary things here. And again, pay attention to this. This is the kind of stuff that you're gonna see on the test. Um, operational excellence has both leadership and management dimensions and needs both. I just said that. Um, I also just said that leaders operate management systems. And I just told you why. You don't need to know why, but when we get to in two weeks, when we start talking about improvement management, I think it'll all begin to make sense here that um, we're trying to create and change and transform towards a positive culture. And I just can't do that if I don't have something for a leader to operate on a daily basis. And so they operate the management systems. When they operate that system or those systems, they begin to influence others. And when they influence, what I want them to be doing is um, paying attention to these kinds of things, these kind of leadership models for operational excellence. Um, I'm about to go into a research project starting in January where I'm going to actually test to see whether or not an outcome, a reduction in medical errors, can be uh, linked uh, quantitatively back to the uh, features of each of these leadership systems here. So we'll know more next year. But um, my hypothesis is that what we're going to find are these is evidence of these three um, leadership models and the features of those leadership models. This is important because um, what I've been doing for 10 years has been teaching people those leadership models without putting labels on them. So I, you know, whenever I tell a leader um, to exercise leadership, what I want them to do is explain and make sense to people um, by navigating to a value. Because if I get down to the value and, and you and, and the leader and the follower share that same value, then resonance occurs around that value and, and they do something extraordinary. They do something different than what they normally would do. And that's a pretty powerful thing whenever it comes to trying to uh, change to a positive culture. And I'm doing this because I also want um, strategy to get pointing in the right direction so that we can get some radical success. Um, let me tell you one more story um, about how this is illustrated. And again, these are things that I learned uh, while I was recalled to active duty, mostly. But um, back in 2008, I think it was, um, there was a presidential election um, that year, and my sons and I were at a Penn State football game. Um, this is back when you could actually go to football games. And uh, we were at this Penn State football game. It was the Penn State-Ohio State game, so it was a really high-stakes game. And um, I can't remember exactly what quarter it was. I know that the score was, you know, it was a neck and neck. They scored, Ohio State scored, Penn State scored, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then there was this TV timeout. 
And so when there's this TV timeout, what happens is the TV referee walks out onto the field. He's got a striped vest on and he begins to count down. He or she begins to count down the, the 60 seconds of the commercial or the TV timeout. Um, so this guy did this and, you know, people are taking a break. So they're standing up, you know, and this guy starts to walk down the stairs in the season ticket holder section. And the thing about the season ticket holder section is that you begin to start to see the same people week after week after week. And uh, nobody knew this guy, he was a younger fella, and, and he had a t-shirt for a particular candidate, um, you know, where, you know, he was, he was uh, showing his support for a particular candidate on the back of his t-shirt. And as he walked down the uh, steps, somebody yelled something obscene at him, and he naturally turned around and, and gave the person an obscene gesture. Um, that began to uh, start a, a shouting contest and uh, suddenly, our little section of the stands was in this massive political debate. Um, there was yelling, there, was, there were uh, um, cursing, there was a little bit of shoving in some cases, and um, it was just crazy. And so my sons and I are standing there, and they could care less, and they were little, and uh, they could care less, and they're watching the TV timeout referee, and they're seeing that the referee is counting down the timeout, and they're beginning to freak out because they can't see because everybody in the stands is in this melee about, you know, some political candidate or whoever the two political candidates were. Um, so the TV timeout is over. Penn State has the ball. Penn State snaps the ball. Quarterback drops back. 15-yard pass. 35-yard uh, touchdown run. And you know, suddenly we're, we're ahead. Penn State is ahead. What do you think happened in the stands at that moment? Let me tell you, and I, normally I actually do this uh, in class so I can actually get your responses to this. But what happened was this complete reversal where people had been at odds, they immediately were high-fiving and hugging each other. And the same people who were just arguing, and then they put the argument behind them. Like, so they immediately just dropped whatever it was they were talking about and went and focused on the game and, and they began to uh, get along again the way they had gotten along before um, this argument erupted. What is that evidence of? It's evidence of that transformational or servant leadership, mainly transformational leadership at the bottom of the triangle where a value had been pricked. Um, and so values can be pricked. And if we have opposite views, opposite mindsets, they can drive us in polar directions. But if we have a com common value that drives us in a singular mindset or a singular attitude, then that can be very uh, coalescing. And so there's, there's power in that, in that transformational leadership. The other uh, quick story I have is from that same Penn State game, because I started to look at this and I'm like, holy cow, I mean, this is powerful stuff. If we understand that we can prick a value down here and get everybody to act the same way, and to act differently than they were just acting, even though they were passionate about the way they were just acting. This is a pretty powerful principle. So the other story from that game is I was watching the, um, the student section. We sat kind of uh, catty corner across the field from the student section. And there are these um, Yale leaders at Penn State. I don't know if you guys have ever seen them before, but they're senior class members. Um, they're peer voted in as Yale leaders. They're not official. They're not there on scholarship. So they're not cheerleaders. They're not, um, I don't know, you know what exactly they are uh, other than they're, they're just peer elected to these, these position as a Yale leader. Um, and what was crazy is I was watching these, these kids, um, you know, leading cheers down there. And all of a sudden, um, this, this kid starts to, you know, go up and down and starts to try to get people to do the wave. Well, on the third time, he actually got the student section, the whole student section to start the wave. And the wave went around six or seven times. And I thought to myself, there's 117,000 people in this stadium. And, and this young person who's probably 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, conceives in their mind that they would like to get 117,000 people to do exactly what they wanted them to do. How do they do that? That's the power of transformational leadership. So um, I just wanted to share a couple of those, a couple of those stories. As you begin to look around you and you begin to see some of the leaders operating around you, um, begin to take a look and see whether or not you can see transformational servant or shared leadership, um, especially when you're, you're beginning to see outcomes or performance 
that is extraordinary. So if you begin to see um, either where you work, things are going really, 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 really well, or if you're familiar with a, a company or an organization that really is a high performing company or organization, look and see whether or not you can see those types of leadership because my, my bet is that you'll find one of the three of those or probably all three of those operating at the same time. So here's my references. These slides with the exception of slide number seven are on the uh, top of the, uh, they're in week nine. So if you're interested in taking a look at those uh, and keeping those or taking notes on those, uh, feel free to do that. Does anybody have any questions about what I covered here tonight? As usual, if you do, I'll be hanging around for uh, 10 or 15 minutes afterwards. Uh